Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the sales leader playbook. Today we welcome Mark Musselman, the global sales lead at Vapor.io. Mark has a huge personality, but an even bigger reputation. He's closed some of the biggest deals in the game, but is now creating a legacy of his very own. This is Mark's playbook. In this series, the 33 CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. to another episode of Hunters and Unicorns. I'm Simon Kutis and I'm joined by my co-host Ollie Kune. Hello everyone. And we are absolutely delighted to be welcomed by, here he is, <laughs> Mark Musselman. <laughs> the prize for the best entrance that is Mark. Yeah. So, so uh, for our yeah. listeners, Mark has just skated in on his, uh, on his skateboard through his living room to make a grand entrance. But uh, Mark, really, thank you very much yeah. for joining us today. Yeah, he, awesome. Yeah, it's great to be here. I love what you guys are doing. Thanks, Mark. I was going to say, you, we, we know you've got a vert ramp in your garden as well. So maybe we should have just done it on the vert ramp. But you know. <laughs> Episode two. <laughs> So when you have your podcast empire, you can come over <laughs> to the Bay Area. We'll do a don't, full. You, you don't dive. have to tempt me too much. So in the way of an introduction, Mark, um, currently SVP of Worldwide Sales at Vapor.io. Tell us a little bit about what Vapor.io is. Tell us a little bit about the mission and the impact you're going to have on this world. You bet. So this is an interesting one and definitely what you'd characterize as a unique, which I've often been attracted to these outliers and very extremely bleeding edge. Uh, you'll, it's a pun because we're basically leading the forefront on edge computing. If you had artery, which is the main backbone of the internet, and then you have vein, which is kind of the traditional CDNs, right? Then you have capillary. So we're ba basically exploiting and building out the capillaries for delivery of all this content. And it's not the thing that people forget about with 5G is it's not just one direction. It's, it's bi-directional. So it's the amount of data that we learned at Sumo, right? At Sumo Logic, the amount of data that's going to be coming in is equal yeah. to or greater to the amount that's being distributed. And so we're, we're figuring out how AI and machine learning can be leveraged at the edge with a bunch of partners that are building compute infrastructure to maintain all kinds of you know, training and uh, sort of curating of data that's coming in from these billions of sources. So it's, it's still early, but I think, you know, we're having a lot of fun at Vapor. Yep. You know, it's a very, very exciting project and you, you are building something quite unique in, in terms of the sales organization. We're going to cover a lot more of that towards the latter stages of this, uh, of this um, yeah. po podcast. What I'd like to do, uh, Mark, however, is I'd like to go right to the beginning. Um, you know, how did you, get, how did you get into software sales? You mean when I had hair? <laughs> All the way <laughs> Yeah, take us to the I beginning. Think it's software, okay. Um, well, it's really interesting. It, it I, I find this part of the story interesting because I always wonder how people got in. Um, 
So I had gone to school uh, in the US, Florida State University, and had a hospitality administration <clears throat> degree, which is a top, depending on the year, three or four school in the States for hospitality administration, because it's tied into the business school. Um, and Ritz, Ritz Carlton recruited pretty heavily out of Florida State. They had a bunch of execs there. There were only 10 properties at the time. We're talking about 90, 1993, right? So um, I got recruited by then to go into management training um, because I wanted to manage an awesome resort, uh, snowboard, surf, whatever. I just, it was in my blood. I grew up working in restaurants and you know I had interned in hotels and, and all that stuff. But I was only there about eight or nine months. And a friend of mine that I grew up with in Virginia um, called me up and we had grown up swimming together, all sports, you know, just growing up since we were really little kids. And he said, hey, uh, I'm working at a new company. It's a, it's a software company and we do internet software. And I was like, oh, cool. Tell me about that. And he said, well, do you know what the internet is? And I was like, oh, like .edu and like <laughs> 10,000 nodes and email and like Gopher and FTP. He's like, you're hired. And I was like, I'm hired. Okay. So I, I actually, I, I just took the plunge. Like it was a little, um, it was, it was interesting. And it's funny because that company was called Intercon Systems. And it was the first company making TCP IP software for Macs, for Apple. Um, subsequently, it was acquired by PSINet which was one of the very first internet service providers. Uh, it was really UUNet and PSINet in the very beginning. Um, and it, it was just those two. If you wanted to get on the internet, you had to buy a T1 or a fractional or whatever from, from one of those two guys um, effectively or someone or from someone that was buying from them. So that, that, that was software and then that put me into internet service provider. Um, when that happened, half of us, in, at least in sales at, at, at Intercon, uh, went to Digex and half had gone to UUNet. Um, and uh, I still have my offer letter from UUNet because it was one of the first really nice IPOs. I went to Digex. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that kept me a little hungry uh, for longer than some of the guys that went to, went to UUNet. But, um, the question then begs, is grit all, always in you or only in you until you get the big home run? But, uh, and selling internet service back then was really interesting. I remember when we opened up Richmond, Virginia, we literally were telling people, you're gonna be able to turn your fax machine off. My. Like we're calling offices <laughs> and saying, you can turn it off, Prom I promise you. You're, gonna, you're not gonna need it anymore. And people are saying, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, it's quite hard it. to fathom that in this day and age, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Were you a good salesperson at that stage, Mark? I don't know. I mean, I, I... Were you hitting all your targets? Were you beating your targets? I mean, I was selling already for a long time because I had mm. been like, you know, I've been working as a waiter, right? Which means you also get to wash dishes and bar ten bar. And all of that stuff. Um, so you're kind of selling in that case. Um, I, I, at a very young age, I still not sure exactly how this happened, but at, at 15, I, got, I was made an assistant manager at a surf shop. Uh, it was a chain of surf shops in the mid Atlantic, so Virginia, DC, Maryland, that um, was the first uh, dealer for Burton Snowboards in the mid Atlantic, the first dealer for Stussy. The owner knew Sean Stussy from way back in the day. Like we did, there were a lot of firsts um, at this shop. And, you know, all of a sudden I was like an assistant manager and had the keys and was doing the money at the end of the day and selling a, a lot. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some of that stuff sells itself. So this kid comes in and he knows he wants his Tony Hawk complete. Right. But, you know, <laughs> other times you have to get really knowledgeable on what it is and, and selling. So I, I don't really, I don't know if I was, any you know better because of that i just think i was already used to trying to explain to someone yeah why something might be better than something else so it's just a natural 
a natural thing for you to grasp, was it, would you say? I don't know. I mean, I like working with people, right? And so the idea that, you know, there's some classes in university that I just, you know, like the accounting stuff, you, you can ask my accountant now. <laughs> like I, never, I just can't sit and look at that. And even law, right? So contracts, just like, you know, some people gravitate towards, they love to sit in front and pour over contracts for hours with no yeah. one around and they're just, and we need them and I love them. But that just, Simon's you know, Simon's really... one of those types, by the way. He loves oh, okay. it. Definitely so that's not, how this I'm works. definitely not one of those types. <laughs> that's how this works. I, I end up doing that task because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, so, 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 Mark, obviously, it was a kind of a really interesting kind of early tra trajectory, you know, 95 to 97 Digex, then uh, Lucent, Sidera, 2000, 2001. Was it Akamai kind of the, the, the real, you know, the, the, the moment in time when, you know, it really started to kind of kick off your, your, your sales career, would you say? Yeah, I think that was the first company that I had been at that truly had defined, created and defined almost solely an entire genre, right? And so, and they had changed how the effectively, you know, I, I almost joked about vapor IO being Pied Piper because they talk about how we're changing the internet, the yeah. fundamental infrastructure of the internet. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing it on a phone with compression and we're keeping things local that need to be local. Um, and Alchemy in a way was Pied Pipering too, like basically saying, look, you inter like we can cache all of this content closer to you. And, you know, it was a, it was one of the best, like if I think about the most awesome companies or places I've worked, definitely Sunshine House Surf Shop. That was incredible experience. <laughs> definitely Akamai. Definitely Blade Logic, but you know, at Alchemy was the first very adult sort of organization, but still, you know, run as fast as you can. No one's going to slow you down. You know, we're going to take over the world. Um, it had a really strong culture, and I got to hand it to the Blade Logic guys because um, I had been the uh, what is it, major account exec of the year in 2004, which was like my second year. And they had gotten in touch with sort of the four top people from the last two or three years. Like one of them was me, one of them was the person that got that the year before me, one of them was like top new, new logo winner, one of them was, you know, top, you know, upgrade, perform like they 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 somehow honed in on and they actually got all of us <laughs> they got f four of wait five of us to start and i have to hand it to the guys they none of us actually knew like we were all like I was like, hey, like, I just wanted to call you and tell you like, uh, I'm resigning. And they're like, me too, I'm going to Akamai. And I was like, what? So I like, I don't know how they pulled that off. It was really interesting. Um, but it was a much different environment uh, than... Who was it that brought you in? Was it Adam? Was it Brian? Who, no, who was it? this was way before those guys. Um, this was when Steve Strahan was running sales. Um, okay. got to return the favor and we brought Steve into Sumo Logic um, and Brian Daly. So Brian Daly had just come in as regional manager, regional director for the, for the West. And according to Steve, who was head of sales, um, it's funny that you mentioned that. I don't know if I saw Brian that day, but I remember walking in <laughs> for the interview and I did, I wasn't from PTC. Like I, I'm mistaken for an um, old school PTC guy all the time. To the we hear this a lot, by the yeah, way, Mark. Yeah. We hear yeah. this a lot. Yeah, sorry, carry on. 
Well, to the point where, where I would just stop saying, no, 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 I wasn't there. I was just kind of like, nod. yeah, man, that was crazy. It was easy <laughs> <laughs> because everyone just assumed. Um, Brian and Steve were, were, Brian Daly and Steve Strahan were from PTC. But I remember walking in, it, it's so classic. They had set up in the lobby of the Sofitel um, in Redwood City and just commandeered a corner like they owned it. <laughs> and we're doing the interviews just out kind of in the in public, like not like in the middle of everyone, but they had, I don't know, maybe they pulled a, pulled a table over. But when I was walking in, I realized later that it was Adam Aaron's oh, wow. uh, that was walking out. And, but he wanted Brian's job and he didn't want a rep job. And I, I, I thought it was really interesting, you know, that, there were other people and people that are running very large sales organizations now and maybe even retired companies we all know and love that actually took rep jobs just to get in right why is uh, that why why did they do that mark uh, you know i think it was um I was it never the really company just... was it the culture was it the people why were they willing to take that i think there was a few factors there you know i think one of them was hey get in and perform it's a meritocracy it'll be just it'll be like ptc if you perform you're gonna go up right and also that the opportunity was big enough and the technology was good enough and you could already kind of see what was happening with opsware where okay uh we're replacing all the old technology from HP and IBM and CA and others, BMC. And uh, it was a two horse game. There were not yeah. three in the bake offs in the POCs tip typically um, in, in the kinds of business we were going after. But you'll see that um, for most people that took that risk, uh, it paid off uh, pretty mm -hmm. well, you know, and that they were able to. In fact, some of them decided that, you know what? I like being in IC. I like the W-2, I like yeah. the lifestyle. And I, I respect that totally. Like when yeah. someone tells yeah. me, hey, I was a manager and now I just want to go back and do this. I know I can do it like, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, Paul Kant did it from, he went from essential software as um, a manager into Blade Logic, didn't he? And he, he, he then went back to an IC. But you joined in May 2005. Now, John didn't actually start until August 2005, right? Yeah. So you're in there before John had started in the business. Well, you have to, like, just to, just to sort of backpedal for a second, mm. like, I, I have no idea what PTC is. Right. Right. I came from a different side. Like, I came from hardcore kind of internet. You know, I came from internet service providers and, you know, Akamai. I didn't know about this, that kind of software. I didn't have any friends at PTC. Um, and I had never really even thought about, you know, that kind of technology. Um, it just, it didn't land on my, my plate. Um, so when, when I started meeting, you know, obviously I met Steve and, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, here's a former college football star, former NFL player. Like, wow, these guys are like smart, you know, typically pretty athletic. Um, these are really interesting people, you know, and I started meeting more and more of the PTC people. And I was like, wow, like, and I started hearing a lot of the stories. Yeah. Um, of how splits were decided and how, you know, just, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a deep well. <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I hadn't met Walski, Steve Walski either until much later. I hadn't met Mark Cranny until much later. Um, but when John came in, Brian called me and said, Oh man, we're, this is, this is so good. He's the best. And I said, Oh great. I can't wait to, to meet him, um, I think I had a pretty big deal 
right when John started, it was like, I want to say it might have been the E-Trade deal. Because uh, I remember being at a kickoff in Blade Logic and they were going to some boat party. They were going to do a boat party as an activity in Boston. And I was working on that deal. And I remember going up to Strahan and Dave and saying, guys, I'd love to go to the boat party and meet a bunch of these people that I don't know. But like, we're kind of in the thick of this thing. And can I sit this one out? And they were like, okay. Kind of like, look at me like, is he just <laughs> messing with us? He just doesn't want to go on a boat. <laughs> um, but they were like, what do you need to get the deal? And I was like, well, this is kind of what I need. And it's against our friends at Opsware. And in fact, it's against someone you know <laughs> that's there. Uh, because he used to be here. And they were like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> what do you need? And I, I laid it out. And I said, I think I can get it done you know, with this. Um, and they kind of were like, oh, that's, you know, mm, oh, okay, well, you know, we went back and forth. It's an internal negotiation, right? Like, how are we gonna frame this deal? What can I, what, what's gonna win the deal, but also how do we maximize, right? And so I said, all right, I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you give me this, what I'm asking for, I will legit go over to that rep's house when we win the deal and toilet paper it. <laughs> They're like, you got it, done, <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, Mark, you, you, you talk a lot about, uh, well, so Opsware and um, Blade Logic, the rivalry was pretty rife. You know, it was pretty fierce, but you, you've referred to it previously as a kind of- a that, uh, You yeah. probably have the similar <laughs> A similar sort of story in the UK of two families that warred incessantly for ages. That, that's that was you, it. You re, you've referred to it as David and Goliath, though, as well, haven't you? I, do. Um, I have. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is I mean, that the presence of Mark Cranny, or was that more to do with um, you know Andreessen and Horowitz and and their kind of clout? You know, what what, yeah. what is it that? You know. Yeah, I mean, I think it had a lot. It was all about the fact that this was Mark Andreessen. Um, I mean, Ben Horowitz was lesser known at the time, right? And so you had the guy that was at NCSA and invented Mosaic, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he had some help. But then you had the guy that did took that and made Netscape. Then you had the guy, that, his next thing was LoudCloud, which then turned into Opsware. And so you had the guy who was on the cover of Time Magazine running the company that you're going after. And we really had, you know, I got to hand it to people like Vic Baishnabi, right? Like talking about like a marketing budget that was so thin. And, you know, we had great people like VJ and Dave, like incredible founders and, and people, but they weren't, you know, Dave has went on to do a lot of incredible stuff after, but it was still kind of unknown. Who are these guys from Boston? Hmm. You know, and so David and Goliath, because like literally we're in their backyard. Literally, like I felt like David <laughs> running around with and James Hollinger and I, the uh, SE extraordinaire. And I'm glad you guys picked up what I was telling you earlier about how important the sales engineers and the SE organization was to play logic into this story. And so I'm glad you guys have plugged yeah. into that. James is booked in. So we're really looking forward to recording with James and hearing good. the pre-sales side. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. Good, good, good. Um, so, you know, we were, I think there was even one time that, I, wanna, I can't honestly, I can't remember if it was Dave or VJ, but one of those two called me up and said, uh, hey, I got two things to talk to you about. And I was like, okay, great. CTO's calling me, damn. Um, he said, one, I got this hotshot engineer. He's a developer, he's young. He wants to get out in the field. He wants to move to, he wants to, move to the Bay Area. Um, he wants to be a SE. Um, would you take him on? And, you know, at that time, both Blade Logic and Ops were, uh, there was scripting and, and sort of 
on the fly coding and customization that was part of the implementation, um, part of the POC. And my brain just said, wow, yeah, I can get an engineer out here with me, done. And he goes, well, he's kind of young and he's Canadian. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm half Canadian too, the good half. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a slam dunk. And like, I mean, we've worked together, you know, James and I, then we did Sumo Logic together. We did Mesosphere together. Like, I'm sure I'll do more, you know, with them if I'm lucky. Um, and the second thing was, oh, Optor is holding their uh, customer event in San Jose. Do you think you would put on one of those sandwich boards? <laughs> and walk with some kind of blade logic like <laughs> logo or something or staying or like blade logic's better like walk around and i was like okay do i have to make make it too <laughs> like you know a sandwich board guy <laughs> and uh you know we we kind of tabled that and we didn't end up doing it but like that's kind of the gorilla tactics Mm. So one, one out. second, Mark. Let, let, let me just hone in on that for a minute. So the CTO yeah. rang you personally yeah. <laughs> to yeah. talk about you dressing up yeah. with an A board, with a sandwich yeah. board, yeah. to crash in on Opsware's party. For sure. And was this before or after you'd just gone round the Opsware South Spurs' house <laughs> and covered it in toilet paper? <laughs> it would have been, it would have been slightly after. Oh, really... <laughs> well, wow. You've heard it here Mark first. The, Mark <laughs> with the special missions. We're going to hear more about your special missions actually in a moment because we're, we're going to move on to kind of BMC. But just, just before we do, and it's an interesting point because I think you're the first person that we've actually spoken to that has been there at the point of John McMahon joining the business yeah. at Blade Logic. And it'd be interesting to know, especially for you, because you, know, you, that was, you were then three years under John McMahon, this influential individual. So, yeah. That day that he came into the business, you've obviously mentioned that it was a, it was a good presence. You knew that he was going to be big. Did he live up yeah. to expectations and how big an impact did he create at that point? Well, so you've never met anybody like John, as, as you guys know. I think it's awesome that you, you were able to get him <laughs> into the program. Um, He's just a combination of so many things, but if I had to boil it down, it's as if General MacArthur and the Dalai Lama had a child. You know, like it's so equal across both of these <laughs> personalities, you know? It's like he could lead the entire army in and win, but also, you know, in a way that the way he thinks about things and how the human aspect of it, because, you know, a lot of people were like, oh God, you can't go to a PTC company. They're all robots. They're just machines or the machines off or on or broken or working. That's how they think about people. And I didn't find that, you know, at all with, with John. Um, he, there was a human, very human element. Um, but that said, whether it was John or Dave or Steve Walski, you did not want to get on the wrong side of the balance sheet. The balance you get on sheet. the wrong side of the balance sheet, you got to prove sort of triumphantly that, you're, that you can get off of it and that you did get, up, get off of it, right? You do not want to be in the red. Um, and I think there was like, to be, to be direct about it, there was fear about being on the wrong side of the balance sheet, you know, like, but also there was an opportunity to like, really, really, really change your life. Like you could, you could, I mean, the reason why I left Akamai is I knew what the software people were doing. And as you know, it was three to four X, you know, what I had made that year. And I, I think you figured out I'm more technology than money driven. Like I'm more drawn to like novel and unique um, than the pure money. Cause I would have gone and 
could have sold storage. A lot of my friends went and just sold storage and just they're retired and they're, but it was boring <laughs> to me <laughs> um, mentally. Um, I kind of got over that with Sumo and logs, but we can talk about that later. But when John, you know, look, that first call that he was on when he got introduced, I think I had just done that deal and he said, I haven't met Mark yet, but um, expecting great things and what, what else can I say about the guy? He's getting it done. And that was like on a team call. And I was just like, whoa, like, okay. So that was kind of like the start of it. So he and I started on a great foot. Yes. You know, like I wasn't the, in a file, a red file that got thrown on his desk that was like, mm, this guy's on the bubble. So, so I don't know if that was part of it or um, he also liked, so did Steve though. And so did Brian. They liked that I was a California guy, but not. You know, they they probably rightfully so. Um, God knows I've hired some of them. That, that uh, think of the California guys are are out surfing, and they're you know doing anything but selling. And there's a different sort of work ethic and drive and efficacy of sort of focus. <laughs> But um, they liked me because I was a I was an East Coast guy. I was a Virginia, DC guy. I was a son of a Marine Corps, and then you know State Department guy. And they they had asked me. I remember in that interview, one of the things that they do is they they're looking for something extraordinary. And I don't tend to stop the boat enough to think about if what I've done is really extraordinary, right? Just keep on going, keep on moving. But they were like, what are the, you know, what, 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 are, what are some of the things that you can tell us that um, would have been, would set you apart? And I was like, mm, I, I saved my best friend's life when we were seniors in high school. And they're like, oh, tell us about that. <laughs> I was like, we were out surfing. We were playing hooky. One time we played hooky. Uh, in our entire life. Um, my mom drove us to catch a big swell that was happening in Ocean City, Maryland. And he took off on a wave, a uh, big one. And then next thing I know, I just saw a board floating. And then I saw him floating face down and I got there as fast as I could. I was breaststroke, I was still swimming all, all through high school. Like my whole, I competed in breaststroke um, a little bit in freestyle, but I got to him really fast and I turned him over and I looked down and he's like, I'm dying. I'm paralyzed. And uh, my mom is a nurse and she had taught me, you gotta be so careful with neck injuries. And I had sort of put my arms under, right? And then breaststroked him in and it's pretty hectic and yelled at a guy to bring a board down and he slid the board under him and lift him up like a stretcher and carried him onto the beach. And my mom walked up at that time. She's an ER nurse. I was one of those, like a movie. I had to actually like slap her cause she was hysterical cause we're, it's on her watch. Wow. Um, helicopter landed. Um, they took him to a near nearby hospital. It wasn't that good. Then they took him to Johns Hopkins shot trauma unit, another helicopter. Um, moral of the story is he's walking today. Wow. He's doing everything anyone else would today. And they, they were like, oh, we haven't heard that one before. Incredible. You know, and then there was a few others. Like, they were like, well, tell us why a California guy we should hire. You know, I was like, well, I'm not a California guy, really. I mean, I do surf. And at the time, I actually wasn't. So the water was too cold and sharks. And, you know, it took me a while. But they, you know, so, you know, they liked I was Marine Corps. My, uh, my, you know, I was born in Tehran, so I was born in Iran. My dad was with the embassy at that time, and they liked the grinder. My dad came from the same town that the Hatfields and McCoys wow. grew up in, Lynch, Harlan County, Lynch, Kentucky, which is like, like the only way to be is grit and grind. Um, he stuck into the uh, Marine Corps at 16 because at that time, like, you know, well, I don't have a birth certificate. Let's go to war. Um, so, so that was, you know, I did learn that from them, 
the idea that like you got to look for something kind of unique. And so when you show up in Blade Logic, you're looking around, you're like, my God, there's a Formula One race car driver. There's an Olympic skier. There's an NFL player. Like it's like it was wow. I was like, what am I doing here? You know, I like at, at some point I was just like, oh wow, this is a whole different arena, maybe a different planet than I was used to. Interesting. And that, look, Mark, what a story. Absolutely breathtaking. Um, so at that point, obviously, you're there at the point where then there's probably a lot of new kind of playbook elements coming into play, yeah. medic. Um, how did you adapt to that? And, you know, did it, did it help? So the interesting thing about so that comes part and parcel with the emphasis on training. Right. Right. And so people talk about always be recruiting, but it was also always be training, hmm. right. Or always be closing. It was also always be training. So there was a lot of always bees. There was always be recruiting, <laughs> always be selling, always be training, always be, um, always be sort that of, yeah, I mean, it was, you had to do it all. Like, like there, was no, there was no place to hide. There was no rock you could crawl under. There was, you know, you, if you were an under the radar guy, um, you know, you could probably do it, but I don't know. Like, you know, if you were a, like your lone eagle guy who didn't have coachability, you're going to have a hard time there. Yeah. You know, and so if you were a lone eagle guy that was coachable or a, or kind of like a semi squad eagle, like that you wanted to group together with other eagles, um, it was your place. And I found that I was doing a lot of those things already that that medic was 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 training on and med med pick. I called it med pick because mm -hmm. I actually put two P's in there even but yep. the um i was doing it but not all the time and not in every instance and there I, I found that like they're right like this is the way to build pipeline this is the way to test pipeline this is the way to test deals this is the way to do it right and for me the champion the artistry sort of gets inserted around uh sort of how to grow a deal and how to create and foster a champion. Yeah. Right. And so is, is that where you went came into your own? Because Mark, you were we have heard this from many of the others. You were referred to as the artist. Well, I'll take um, it. Yeah, you'll take it. <laughs> because but, at first John called me the workhorse. And I thought that was great. I was like, <laughs> I don't, or maybe it was pack horse. Like just load him up. He just keeps on going. Um, but no, artist. That makes me happy because I always felt like there was, um, you needed equal parts art and science, you know, in order to, to, to really execute on the playbook, hmm. right? Because the art allows you to make audibles and sort of retrench the, the art of slowing down to speed something up eventually. Like there's, there, 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 I, fell in love with the artistry, you know, side of it. It's amazing, Mark, because those things that you've spoken about are actually some of the core pillars that are, that are coached, but it seems as though you were able to really embrace that because it, it, it kind of naturally went with a lot of your instincts, perhaps, because we've heard this quite a lot about medic is a, you know, it's a, it's a um, qualification methodology. It's not a sales methodology. Yeah. It's a qualification methodology. It allows you to understand where you are. And that means that sometimes you need to go back to go forwards. Yes. But that played into your strength as an artist. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think there were some scenarios where true, genuine champion building is art. Yeah. I mean, true, genuine champion building. Right, right. So someone like those champions that I was working with at Blade Logic, I've gone on to sell with them and 
and to them at almost every place that they've gone ever since. And these are some of like, some of the biggest, you know, names here in the Bay Area where, cause I was a territory rep at first, right? Um, and I've actually considered a lot of them personal friends now. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm sure you're probably invited around for Sunday dinner quite often from a lot of them. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I, I had more than one at my 50th uh, celebration. I know, I know, I don't look good. <laughs> you wouldn't say that, Mark. <laughs> um, a day over 40, come on. <laughs> well, but also, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to talk about at Blade Logic, but like mm -hmm. I can remember uh, Shannon Bradley, who was amazing, one of the best. Um, she had told me, hey, you're going to get back into surfing. And I was like, I don't know, Shannon, like, I'm cool. Like I snowboarding in Tahoe. I'm fine. I don't need to get in that crazy water. And uh, she's like, no, because like um, my champion um, said he'll meet you, but it has to be at 6 a.m. at the boat docks <laughs> in Endemar, Pacifica. He has a board. He has a wetsuit for you. He's a big surfer. And I was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not like she asked me to go jump out of an airplane without a parachute, right? So it's funny because I'm actually looking out the window at those exact docks now. I ended up moving very close um, to that beach break. And he's um, become a really, 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 really good friend and, 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 and mentor to me in a lot of ways. Um, and we've done a bunch of cool stuff together. So like, to me, it's that people part of it, you know? It's like how, if you can like work with really smart, fun, cool people and sell to really smart, fun, cool people. I mean, that's kind of why we're in this IT sales, I, I, I think, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, is you, you wanna be surrounded by people that are smarter than you. That's, you know, current, current company included. Like, hey. <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> <laughs> so so i suppose you know with that do, do you think they really bought in because the way you do articulate yourself you don't talk like a sales guy right you talk like a a techie to 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 an extent and i mean that with you know with a lot of you know with a lot of compliment you're obviously very passionate about technology do you think that that's why you are able to showcase some of that flair because it's something you genuinely believed in and, and, and that you know created the gravity to those champions because perhaps they trusted you more do, do you think that's maybe part of it are you calling me a nerd <laughs> i would never I'll, own that. I'll take it i'll take the <laughs> to, so to me one of the highest compliments and sahir and damon and like this is the highest compliment that someone could give me is like oh shit you're our sales guy i thought you were the se <laughs> to me there wasn't a better compliment um, as a individual contributor, right? Like, oh, wow, like you could switch me in and out. That to me meant that like, like they tr they, there was a level of trust there and that there was, um, they would make time for me and that when the phone rang and they saw my name, when that happened, they were like, yeah, cool, I'll take the call. Um, but I also found it interesting. This is the first place I really saw this happen because it wasn't really like that at Akamai. But at Blade Logic, there were several former SEs that had converted to the dark side and had become salespeople. Brian Daly was one of them. Um, and I actually had hired a few people subsequently that were XPTC people once we were at BMC that started out as SEs and maybe even were SEs at PTC first. Um, and so that interchangeability is really, really unique. Cause like if you can not have to do, first of all, you don't want to do a six legged meeting. And if you have to, you can do a four legged meeting, but if you can do a two legged meeting. You can cover a lot of ground, you know, back to the Akamai thing. I didn't really finish that off. So five of us start on the same day. Um, and I want to say in six months later, there was three 
And 12 months later, maybe it was 13 months. I had to ask him. There was one. Like I was the only one that was like, okay, I can thrive. I can deal. I can make money. I can do this. Yeah. You know, because there's sacrifices involved for sure. Like you, you have to want it really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Know? So, 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 so Mark, I just wanted to focus, just go, kind of go back a little bit to the channel, right? Because it's actually become quite an important part of your playbook. Now, you yeah. know, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, there's obviously a link in your ability to build champions and your ability to build channel. You know, my mind's gone straight there. So, so tell us a little bit about your views on channel um, and how you approach building a channel. Yeah, so it's... Um... I think about it like you can go out and water your yard with your hose and you can do that every time or you can get a shovel and PVC piping and an automator and like you can dig the yard up, lay the pipes in, set up the sprinkler system or you can keep going, you know, hand going around and watering. So, I always think about channel ideally is like, how do I put that system in? Like how I, how can I go to sleep and all of that's going to be working. And I think about channel in those terms and, and the, and alliances as well. It's like, how do you get another thousand people to sell for you? Right. How can you, it's like a force mass multiplier, right? How do you amplify? Right. How do you take your acoustic guitar? How do you plug it into an amplifier? Like that's, I've, I've just sort of, I'm kind of enamored with the idea of turning that on, like getting that turned on. And it's, it's um, I haven't always been able to do it because you have a lot of friction at yeah. their company and at your own company, you know, unless you're a channel only play. So if you're like some of the storage companies, some of the network device companies, um it they start out day one right even cisco had in its heyday you know single digit maybe maybe very low double digit direct deals right most was done through channel var si um but that was a conscious decision so when a company starts out now um they have three choices, I think. Direct only, some kind of blend between you know, channel and direct, or channel only. And I think you have to study that. And I'm not advocating any one of those three over any of the other three, because I think it's very situation specific. But you should spend a lot of time thinking about that um, and thinking about what's best and what works uh, at that stage in the company. There are companies that convert too. You know, you have to take a, you take a hit on margin, but then with what you get back is a multiple, a multiplier, an amplification. Channel amplifier, you, you refer to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are the foundations, Mark, that you believe are required in order for you to make the channel work in that kind of environment where it's a kind of retrofit? Oh, is this where maybe my uh, something I call skeptical militant optimism? <laughs> SMO. There, it's SMO. We have a thing now. Um, you know, you have to like stay very optimistic that this is going to work. Just like it, it, just like any startup, turning on a channel is like a startup, right? And so you have to be equal parts very very optimistic this will work this will work this will work but also skeptical in that you know healthy skepticism in a startup is great because you're questioning things how is this going to work how is that going to work what happens here you have to do the all of, you can do this flow chart of like you know step by step if this then that um that that i think is is helpful and and very valuable to, to a business. Um, it's, it was kind of like, I don't know. It was almost like channel is a bad word for a lot of people. 
you know it's a dirty word it's ugly it's gross like impalatable but I, you know i think for me i always thought distribution is the key right and so if you can automate distribution then so be it like let's do it let's make it happen i mean i think we had some success um especially with BMC inserting a lot of the global outsourcers and systems integrators into the equation. Um, and they were already make, they were making decisions often on behalf of their clients, right? You know, global 100 type clients. And so, uh, you know, I, I remain skeptical though, too, like, mm, are they really going to get it done? How much training is this going to take? Are we going to, is it a lot of, you know, I used to think about it like, do you get, does a, I should use it, I should say kilo. So does a, does a, does an, you know, uh, but I, I usually say, does an ounce of effort get a pound of results or does a pound of effort get an ounce of results? You know, because I'm, my mind really wants to get to the, always be in the, you know, ounce gets a pound, you know? And I actually caution people when they go to a big company now. Yeah right? If they're coming to me with like a, you know, career question, I said, okay, like sometimes at a big company, you're just going to have to be okay with a, you know, a pound of effort gets an ounce of results versus at a startup, you're going to get, you know, potentially a pound of effort off an ounce of results. But when you look around for help, there's not going to be anyone there. You got to do it. And so there's, you know, a lot yeah, of the gets. Yeah. So do you think the important part, rather than leaving it to chance, a good you know, channel account manager, channel sales manager, whatever you want to call them, um, is a, a real hands-on approach, making sure that they're every inch of the way with the... Yeah, I mean, the channel people that I've had the most success with and alliances people that I've had the most success with were great direct salespeople and sales managers yeah. that decided that they also were quirky enough like me that they love the opportunity to try and mechanize uh, an opportunity to try yeah. and just really sort of, again, I guess back to amplify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to frame where we are. So obviously we've done three years at Akamai, three years at Blade Logic, IPO, acquisition BMC joined as a uh, kind of went in as a sales specialist with the service automation tool, then worked on that global account management role with Cisco with the OEM partnerships, then moved it into a global role. Um, then onto a sales director. So a good four years at BMC. Surprising. On, and it went really fast. Right. And, and, and again, you know, I think we've answered some of the questions to why that would have been, you know, I think the fact that you are getting involved with something new, you're building a startup in a large organization, probably yeah. kept, you know, as well as having John and all the other you know, guys around you probably gave the interest to the role to keep you going probably as long as it did. Um, yeah. And then onto what has been and, and congratulations, because I know this is obviously recent news along with Snowflake. Um, an opportunity to go, and I think it was Vance, you and Vance went and took on an opportunity to go and yeah. start up Sumo Logic. Well, that was, again, you know, back to that whole, wow, I may never have to interview again, yeah. like kind of thing. It was, it was Dave. So David Acheria had joined Greylock. Right. And oh, this was, wow. Yeah, this was in between um, what, what he did, I guess, at OpenView and then, as we all know, Mongo, right? And mm. So he had gotten in touch with me and said, um, hey, I'm joining Greylock. There's a really interesting company. Um, they've asked my help looking for sort of two things, a CEO and a sales leader. And uh, would you want to meet? And I said, absolutely. So I had gone in and met with um, Greylock, um, passed that one, and then met with Mike Spicer, um, which is a whole nother conversation and so much mad respect uh, for him and yeah. 
at the time he was incubating a lot of companies, including Snowflake. And he mentioned, yeah, I got this other little database thing, but it's not, you know, it's really, <laughs> really, I want this one. Back to luck. <laughs> not that Sumo Logic was bad luck. I don't yeah. want to, you yeah. know, just, you know, it's like, two, uh, which street do I go down? Um, <laughs> and so I met the founders and I, uh, they were great. You know, they were awesome and we just hit it off. Um, the, the hair on that dog was that the CEO search was still on and Vance was interested, but it, it, it entailed a move from Boston out to California. And there was, I, I actually signed my offer letter before he did. Just fingers crossed that like, you kind of want to know the guy you're working for, you're going to work for when you, you know, take a job. But Kumar was acting CEO and he was founder, co-founder, and he was great um, in the meantime. Um, and yeah, it was one of those things. I had the opportunity to go and be, you know, run the West or run a bigger piece of a very, you know, a, a bigger organization. And in hindsight, there was no, like I said, options were electric. There was no bad answer because all of those companies that, I was talking to uh, were people I loved and went on to have immense exits. Um, and so there wasn't a bad answer, but the idea that like, oh, you know, at Sumo Logic, there was a period of time where like there was a scenario where Splunk was like Siebel and Sumo Logic was like Salesforce, right? You had this enterprise software that was not cloud ready. Uh, versus a born in the cloud native AWS situation. Um, and so that to me, that in itself to me was just enough, you know, meat on the bone to like, all right, like, okay, like this is probably way riskier. This is prop potentially career suicide. This is scary to be the guy, you know, like wake up with butterflies kind of stuff. Um, but also thrilling. Um, danger and delight grow from the same vine, right? So, um, but you know, it was, a, I love that. And I've, I can't tell you how many emails and texts and calls I got after the IPO, of, you know, from people that we brought in and hired. A lot of them are Blade Logic people, BMC people, and that like it was a very rewarding uh, experience for them, it was hard. It was a tough, it was tough sledding um, at zero revenue. Like that's not for the faint of heart. That's not for the queasy. Um, and uh, I'm really happy for them. Like one of the things that I learned from John was giving stock options as a bonus and for contests um, and for performance. And so and Vance had been indoctrinated in it too. So we, we, I, one of the, one of the best things I've ever had happen in my entire, you know, tech career. I have three simultaneous careers. Tech is just one of them, but. We'll talk about the other ones in a minute. <laughs> is that he was an inside sales rep um, and then got promoted to, you know, corporate sales rep and, um, like he went from SDR to like true inside, right? Quota bearing. And um, he said, he sent me a picture and he goes, I finally got my bonus. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, do you remember when I won that new logo hunt contest that one month and you got me 600 stock options, 600 shares? I was like, yeah. He goes, well, I just did the math. And that was a pretty darn good bonus. <laughs> so like stories like that, I yeah. just love. Yeah. Like that made my week, you know, like that, that's the kind of creativity and fun that I think that we had. And one of the other things we instituted there was um, an award for someone outside of our immediate sort of department or structure or reporting that was a quarterly award for the person that helped us <clears throat> the most. And like, I know it's Sumo Logic. Mark, this is one of your, this is one of your playbook items, right? This is actually yeah. something that you really, really believe in, right? 
I do. I mean, I think it's G, you know, I don't know where G fits in medic or medpick, but like for gratitude, right? And so internally, like who recognition, who helped you? Um, it also, look, you know, to be altruistic about it, it also fosters kind of a competition amongst the execs, <laughs> you know, like, hey, I want to win that. I think we called it the Grand Sumo award and every sales kickoff we made a big deal about it and you know we all pitched in and got them something that we knew that they 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 wanted or liked um and i just thought it was cool we've done that ever since um you know done some kind of a recognition program that was just something ad hoc from sales to them not like I think it's great when companies do that too, like more generally, you know, like spot awards and things like that. But uh, yeah, that's something that's new in the playbook. Um, it's interesting, like when people feel recognized and valued and when people feel um, that they're not taken for granted, they, they'll go on to do even more amazing mm. things. Mm. So you've done nearly four years at Sumo Logic. Your last role was VP of Strategic Alliance and Business Development. So again, obviously working with your experience and I suppose the success that you had uh, at BMC in that alliance piece, that obviously played a, a big part in what you did with Sumo Logic as well, right? Yeah, so that one was interesting. Um, so we were expanding internationally, right? And so I had uh, helped open up parts of the world but at that time like i was definitely above my a little, not from a sales execution standpoint but from like all right like uh, hire train and run a global sales organization was it just wasn't something i had done before um and so we brought in uh someone to do that jim and i moved over to manage and try to start up that whole amplification process. And one of the reasons why Vance said, hey, this is what I think we need the most right now, um, is we were you know, small and, and Splunk was going from strength to strength, let's face it. Like they were not stalling. They were not stalled. They were accelerating um, and they were so much bigger um, than us. And Elastic was free. <laughs> so, you know, everything has a price, right? But you know, let's just say like there was competition. Um, and I had figured out a way to harness the AWS Salesforce and got lucky to be in the right place at the right time where I had made the right connections within Amazon. And Sumo Logic actually was high on Amazon's radar because we were like consuming more data, consuming more EC2, than, than any other company of our size. By virtue of we were doing real-time data collection and analytics wow. and reporting and alerting. Like we were moving around tons of data. We were putting so much data up into AWS. Um, and so we were leveraging tons of S3, tons of EC2, any other new service that they came down the line, we were on the beta list for. And so frankly, that relationship had started with Christian and Kumar and Bruno uh, the founders. Um, and I just took it to a different kind of place with their alliance team to where we were a beta for a sell with a concept where the AWS reps could get quota credit, quota relief for deals that we sold. So if we sold a million ACV deal and it was registered and we did it in combination with them, they were going to, we weren't competing with them or, you know, in any way, shape or form. We were actually selling with them. And so this was a program that I want to say three companies were picked um, to launch the beta. A guy named Scott Barnison, who's still a good friend and a mentor, has gone on to do unreal things at AWS and, and Amazon, um, was the guy that was really, you know, on the other end of this one. And um, it was a hard nut to crack, you know, with finance and an organization that big. Um, the other thing we were able to do is like, one of the things we did is figure out how to get Akamai logs into Sumo Logic, which was, um, they're very verbose and very hard to sort of get at and pick through at the time. I'm sure they've 
I'm sure it's all been streamlined. Um, but the ability to put um, that kind of technology into the hands of, uh, I actually wasn't able to get Akamai to resell that because they, they weren't, they have resellers, they don't, they don't resell. You know, there's a lot, you know what, there's a bunch of companies that are like that. A bunch of the data center operators are like that. Um, I'm finding now in this world. Um, so they weren't all successes, but we, the things that we did with AWS was pretty groundbreaking. I can remember getting calls from a lot of the Greylock portfolio heads of sales um, saying, how did you do that? Like, you know, whatever board member heard about it and asked me why we're not doing that with AWS. Like, can you, yeah. can you help us? And so I ended up, you know, gi giving back a little bit because Greylock was really good at that. Like they did like that whole temple learning thing, like where they brought together yeah. a lot of the heads of sales for dinners or other kind of share, share best practices kind of events. Um, yeah. It was very valuable for me to be able to just be in a room with all of those guys. Yeah. Well, mess. So, which then leads on to Mesosphere, right? Because and that the role that you played at Me Mesosphere as the head of business development, there yeah. was that was big on data center operations and alliances and and that sort of thing, wasn't it? So, what was unique about Mesosphere, and you know, they had. DCOS, Data Center Operating System. It's a very bombastic name, and it was a very sort of audacious sort of claim and goal. Um, and so you put yourself right in the middle of everything if you're this, the key orchestrator and scheduler, right? So you're in the middle of storage, compute, network, application, security, containerization, Microsoft, like it was, it was Grand Central Station. Like, I, I mean, I can remember the first three months there, I never left the office, but I had meetings nonstop, almost sunrise to sunset with people coming to us. Cause at the time it was one of the hottest companies. Docker and Mesosphere were legit. Like it's the hottest companies yeah. <laughs> in Silicon Valley, pre-Kubernetes, right? Pre-K8. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I had an opportunity to interface with the um, Andreessen team. And that's where I actually first kind of met Mark Cranny, believe it or not, because <laughs> he was assisting the guys. Um, that was Kosla and Andreessen. And we ended up getting Microsoft to invest. Um, we, the big thing I did there was embedded the DCOS um, into Azure. So it was Azure Container Service was powered by DCOS and we had worked out a, a payment scenario against the compute billing and like it was really cool work and that uh, that unlocked Microsoft doing the investment into Mesosphere um, at the time because um, they needed a business deal in place and like day one that's what I started working on. But you know I would say from a it, it, it changes back to the luck thing. Like um, they're still going, they're called DTUIQ now. Um, yeah. Still have a lot of friends there. It's just a different world post Kubernetes, you know, and I think they found a way to, to execute. Um, but I really, I mean, I wasn't planning on making, I think you've seen in my, you've looked at the CV. I don't really hop around, but like I made it, it was impossible not to do the vapor thing. Right. And yeah. so it was, a, it was an excruciating decision. Um, I, I may have even gotten, don't tell anyone, but I may have even gotten hives over the, that sort of decision. But, um, Cole Crawford is a hard man, to, <laughs> hard man to refuse. And he had, um, I was in New York there was big Mesosphere deals going down in New York and I was doing some meetings there and he's like, Oh, you're in New York. Why don't you go in and meet Don do it at Goldman? And I was like, the Don do it. And he's like, yeah. So Don was the CIO. I think I mentioned him already. Um, and I want to say I was staying over the weekend in New York. So like somehow we fit it in on like on a Friday 
kind of late afternoon. And then um, I went in and I was a meeting with Don, who's the CIO, pre-IPO partner. Everyone in sales and financial services is always trying to get to Don. Um, and four other people. And I was like, whoa, what is this? This is an expensive meeting for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Little me, what do we want? But we had a great discussion about the ecosystem, about Docker, about containers, about just how everything was changing, how microservices were gonna, you know, proliferate, and it was really stimulating and invigorating. Um, it was Don and his right hand, and then three of the people that were on the investment team that uh, for Vapor. Um, and at the time, Goldman didn't really do seed or invest in this kind of stage of a company, but Don really liked it. And um, I walked out and I walked out of uh, uh, the, the headquarters, which is one of the most Zen places on the planet, by the way. I always, other than Uniqlo headquarters in Tokyo, where they're meditating like an hour a day. But, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> I don't know what I pictured. You know, I, I thought it was going to be chaos, like hectic, like, ah, so boys. And it was like so chill. Um. So then, you know, like. The ums coming out. If you ever get the chance to do a meeting there, um, you know, if they ever do that again. And like the artwork in the random conference room is like some priceless work of art, you know, it was just. It was just a whole nother ball game. But as I'm walking across the street, the phone rings and Cole's like, you're hired. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, do you like Don? I was like, Don's the best. What are you talking about? He's like, he goes, no, no, no. Like, we want to hire you. I was like, well, you could have told me that before I went in there. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know. Well, whatever you did, they said, um, you know, kind of a whatever it takes. And, um, basically came in as maybe what a co-founder would get, you know? And so I made the move, you know, I'm still friends with all the, all those folks there and um, wish messages for only the best. But in this case, it was just too hard to pass up because I didn't, wasn't gonna be able to get a stake like that unless I legit started something. Um, and also, you know, the idea that, creating the mesh between the wireless and the wireline for the next generation and next generations was too hard to pass up. You know, at the time it was just Goldman Sachs. And then I think we mentioned we got Crown Castle to invest, which is a massive real estate investment trust. Um, and, and soon after, well, I guess I was a year in, we got Berkshire Partners to invest, which is a really strong infrastructure private equity um, company, but like it couldn't be more different than SAS. It couldn't be more different than Sumo Logic. Sumo Logic was let's write code, let's deploy it in AWS. Boom. Great. I mean, this is literally like sending out container sized miniature, like shipping container sized miniaturized data centers and laying fiber and turning on networking devices at mobile towers. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. But but Mark, you know, I suppose, like, yeah. I it's suppose. so. It, but that's me. Yeah. Like I just kind of yeah, swing yeah. the pendulum back and forth. Like you would never say. You probably at this point couldn't say, "Well, he's a software guy," or "He's a SaaS guy," or you know, it's just I kind of done so many of these things. Yeah, I was going to say you you are actually literally laying the foundations of the future, and I think that that's obviously something that someone with your you know with your background you know the things that really ring your bell you can clearly see it's something that you'd really want to kind of get behind well i think four years ago people thought we were kind of crazy other than super visionary like don at goldman right and then like two years ago people started to say and eh, they might be onto something and then like even just in the last six months people have been like oh man these guys they're on it. Like they are the one to beat. And so um, they have a saying that if you're, you know, being too early is the same as being wrong or being too late. 
Mm. Um, and so you got to have some stamina and some gumption, right, to stick out a long yeah. ride like this. Um, because this could be, people forget too, like the startup world, it's not, someone might have luck. They might land in a job and they go public in a year. Someone might have luck where, you know, they, in three or four years, the company has a massive exit. But on, on the balance of things, it's typically seven years. And it's typically seven startups that someone has been to before they get a quote unquote home run or unicorn, mm -hmm. although there's tons of unicorns these days. Um, but it's typically like you're talking like Sumo Logic, like what did I join Sumo Logic um, nine years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, like these yeah. take a long time potentially, you know, to play out. And like at Sumo, we had like, I mean, you couldn't say a single thing about the investors. We had Greylock, Sutter Hill, Mike Spicer, Excel, Sequoia, like Big Boy Club, you know, and 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 it was great to see that that exit happened for those people that have been in it for so long. But it's also relative because Sumo Logic, you know, in a Washington DC or in an Atlanta or even in Austin is a poster child for massive success. But in Silicon Valley, when you're sitting under the shadow of, you know, all, everything else, it just becomes pretty relative. And I would just say like, there's still a lot of money to be made and great jobs at these companies that are not snowflakes. You know, they can't all be snowflakes. Yeah. Mm. They can't all be splunks. Mark, you know, it's really, really helpful insight. And I think, you know, we can certainly, um, you know, it's very helpful. Um, I suppose what I wanted to kind of also take a moment to talk about very quickly is time away from work. You know, I, I, and I know you've obviously someone that is very, very dedicated in, in your work. Um, you've obviously got your ex extracurricular, but just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you keep yourself focused and what you do outside of work to kind of keep you, uh, keep you motivated and keep you going. Oh, well, you, you know about some of my hobbies. I have too many hobbies, I, I think is what it comes down to. But like, um, I don't know, I've been riding boards, you know, going on, 35 years by that i mean like i grew up identify a skater i grew up as a skater in the dark ages of skateboarding in the 80s um building wooden ramps like phineas and ferb style in my backyard like just doing a lot of that we fell in love with the idea of surfing and the whole california and hawaii lifestyle Got into snowboarding very, very early. That shop, Sunshine House, I worked at was, I mentioned the first, one of the first, if not the first dealer for Burton Snowboards in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and started snowboarding, we started snowboarding on golf courses behind <laughs> snowmobiles on flat stuff in Virginia. Like, I think there's a, that people used to make the homemade magazines, the rags, like for punk rock or skateboarding and, I just found some pictures of us snowboarding down this power line cut in the woods because we, you know, we just would hike up and ride down it. So like, I, I just, you know, I, I love the boards and surfing. I would do it every day if I could. And I think it's definitely a mind body kind of experience. Um, and to me, like those kinds of things, skateboarding is fun because you can do some, ride some really cool man-made stuff. But like the idea that snow and water is just this natural resource that can somehow these humans can harness and leverage, uh, it just, uh, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, so I got that going on. I got the two kids, um, which are, they're, they're not, I mean, I won't say they're on autopilot, but I just got really lucky with two amazing little nerds like me that are, smart and you know switched on um but you know the music thing was funny because i want to say 
I want to say that was one of the first things John asked me about because John, da John um, Brian Daly had said, oh, you know, you got to meet my guy, Mark. He's like, I don't know how to describe him. He's like, I don't know, like East Coast guy, but he's like, he's kind of a DJ. <laughs> and like that was before DJs, like, you know, DJs made a hundred bucks a night, 200 bucks. This was before Las Vegas and like, you know, mega EDM dance hits. Um, and it's just for the love of it. And I always collected vinyl. Um, and I do believe the art of DJing is gone now with laptops and stuff. Like to me, the art was, you know, the, the guys, you know, in the Bronx figuring out how two turntables might work together um, to make music. Um, I have a great music tip for you, actually. It's Georgie Sweet from Burn Meth. Did I say that right? Burn Meth. She has a new album out on Bandcamp. I don't want to say the next Adele, but maybe the next half Amy Winehouse, which is still oh, a lot. Wow. Nice. So it's like Neo. Nice Future plug Global. there. Yeah, I'll send you guys the link. It's not yeah, even yeah, out. I, I, we'll add the link on the uh, on the video. Just oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm a huge fan. Um, but the music stuff is interesting. So we started. There was an art gallery called 111 Minna. It's still there. And it was a very tiny little art gallery, but it was um, known to have given um, a lot of visibility to some of the first wave of uh, street artists coming out of San Francisco. So street art would be someone that's doing murals, not really graffiti, it's just like doing artwork in public spaces, murals, but then has to figure out a way to like turn it into something that you could hang on your wall as well. Um, and so I started going there a lot on Wednesday nights. They had a, and this is pre Twitter and all that stuff, but it was, a, let's call it a hard door to get in. Um, and not for fancy posh reasons. It was just the number of people that wanted to get in was, it was very democratized kind of, um, door and event, but it turned, it just blew up and the whole gallery then tripled in size. It, um, and I ended up being a resident DJ there for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. Um, and the guys that were throwing a lot of the events there had their own record label. And so I started making music with them too, as I was an old, I was a drummer, I actually just got a drum set. I'm very excited. A seventies vintage drum sets. First one I've had since high school, wow. but I had a drum background. And so I got into drum programming. All of a sudden there was a million drum sets in my, in my computer, in my Mac. Um, and so I just got fascinated with it and we started making music and these guys were releasing music that was getting played in, you know, on the radio in the UK and which is very progressive, as you know, for this kind of, you know, any, any type of music that's sort of, splintered off of electronic or dance um, or chill out or whatever. But they, um, they, they've been amazing. Um, still super good friends with them. We still have the label. Uh, the production team I'm with, uh, it's, it's, it's a guy named JD Moyer and I, we've, we've got a sixth album in the works right now. COVID has put a bit of a, damper on that one but uh <laughs> we um we got licensed for a lot of interesting stuff so mtv back in its heyday with a bunch of its channels we're using um a lot of our early material as background music for some of their some of those reality shows that were the very groundbreaking and early like real world and, and whatnot road rules um, we had a song that was signed to John Digweed's label, um, Bedrock in the UK, that was, uh, it was on licensed to CSI. I could send you the link to the episode when CSI was number one show, the real CSI, not like Miami or Las Vegas. Like, I mean, it is Las Vegas, CSI, Las not Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Not the spinoffs. Um, number one in the world in like 50 countries or something and so like wow. it was legit like the checks were like no i don't want to say they were blade logic style but a couple of them came through and you're like maybe i could go make a run at this and i don't know it's just been a creative outlet you know it's just been a way yeah. to 
Mm. Keep in mind. Yeah, it's incredible how you've been able to kind of find that balance. And, and I, I, you know, we're going to go to a summary in a moment, but I think there's obviously a, a lot of reasons why. Um, I, I suppose that the, the final question we always ask, Mark. Hold on, is, before we go there, before we go there, I'd hate to miss out on this one because before we set, and when we first spoke to you, you told us, and, you know, this story, the 33 CXOs, is being kind of, you know, given a number of different paradox. I think we have Brian Blonde talking about um, uh, the paradox between this and the last dance. Oh yeah. And you told us that we should go and watch a, a, um, a documentary called The Bones Brigade. Absolutely, and yeah. We did exactly that. But can you just for the viewers, tell what The Bones Brigade was and why you told us to go and watch that, um, that episode? Oh, that yeah, matter. so the Bones Brigade was a kind of a groundbreaking skateboard team under Powell Peralta. So the brand was Powell Peralta, George Powell and Stacy Peralta. Um, I always thought about John McManus like Stacy Peralta. Like, so mm -hmm. Stacy was one of the best skateboarders of his time. So if you go back and look at who first was skateboarding in pools, it's when there was a drought in Los Angeles and it was Tony Alva and it was Stacy Peralta and it was Jay Adams. And there's, you know, after that, a whole nother, you know, cadre. Um, and so then these guys were sort of under these really large monolithic late seventies uh, skateboard companies where like, they wanted the skateboards in every toy store, right? And so Paul Peralta kind of came up and they're like, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Stacy Peralta said, I'm going to basically go out and handpick, not, not necessarily the guys that are the best, not necessarily the guys that are winning the most, but they're coachable and they will be a great attribute to the team. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. So he went and found Tony Hawk when Tony Hawk was like, just a, just a tiny little guy. Steve Caballero, Lance Mountain, Mike McGill, the guy who first did a 540, wow. McTwist. And then if you kind of follow it, went on to like Rodney Mullen, who effectually, the, you know, between Rodney Mullen and Mark Gonzalez and Nottis Coppas, the godfathers of modern day street skating, which is now in the freaking Olympics, if they ever have the Olympics again. Um, so I always thought like, if you look at story, like he's kind of like Stacey Peralta, like he picked, he fostered, he bet on and he backed. And you know, as long as you, as long as you didn't let him down, yeah. I mean, he was going to be there for you. So I, I'm glad you guys went and watched that. We did. And, and I pulled two really interesting quotes from it that I'd just like to read out, which was, um, I look for skaters who are hungry to win, hungry to progress, guys who knew how to take a fall and get back up again. Again, if John McMahon had said that, it wouldn't have been put out of context. Not at all. Yeah, no, that's fantastic that you found and, that. And finally, these, all, all, these guys were all young, charged up alpha males, who are very eager to make a name for themselves, which again, <laughs> I, I can see it. And, and I'm really pleased you made us watch that because, you know, in true artist style coming from you, there had to, it had to be something like that. And yeah, we, yeah. Drew, we drew to exactly the same paradox. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for alluding us to that. Yeah. Um, and just before Simon, we asked that. It's on that, Netflix now. Is it on Netflix? It is on Netflix as well. And there's a follow up as well, which you pointed me in the direction of, which I've watched now. So, <laughs> which is great. Um, but there was also one quote that we haven't mentioned that we did speak about, which okay. is how you referred to the BMC takeover. Oh. Oh, well, I mean, I think it might have been in that same. It, it, it's someone it's it's, it's, it's the one about the, um, the ship and the plane. <laughs> oh, so there's a couple. One of them was, um, the one of them, one of them I remember thinking, I distinctly remember thinking about this and someone asked me like, what's it like? Who was on the outside? And I was like, it's kind of like, um, 
like a huge marshmallow, like subsumed a katana, like a Japanese, like shogun blade. And so we're in there and we're just gonna have to like figure out like how to cut our way out um, and move fast again and we will. So I don't know if it's <laughs> that one. I know that there's the speedboat and the aircraft carrier. Speedboat and the aircraft carrier. A speedboat taking over an aircraft carrier. I absolutely yeah. love that and it couldn't be more any more truer. So um, yeah, needed to get a digital footprint of that one, Mark, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the way, the way you guys have approached it, Ollie and Simon, was intriguing. That you picked up the, the scent, as it were, because it's really an amazing story that mm -hmm. even with all of your interviews, I'm sure there's another 50 gold veins of interesting stuff um, and stories uh, and fodder, um, but that you guys recognized it and have, um, you came at it with a genuine curiosity, a genuine interest um, that I respected. Um, and I hadn't seen that from anyone that's trying to do what you're you're trying to do. And I mean it, like when we expand, like uh, I can't wait to work with you guys and. Amazing, oh, that's a really nice thing to say, Mark. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that. thanks for that, Mark. So Simon. Well, I, I suppose the, the, Sorry, the, I keep taking over. No, no, no. Go, go. <laughs> so, uh, the, the final you question. Think. Yeah, the final question we always. You're going to ask me? Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that because that'll probably be an hour's worth of conversation. Oh, God, no, we won't. <laughs> no politics on this show. <laughs> yeah, strictly no politics. We got Boris, we got Boris, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the last question we always ask, Mark, is um, in your opinion, does the hunter make the unicorn? Oh, that's such a tough one. Um, it can. It certainly can. But I think, you know, there's a lot of unicorns that are more like laundromats that you know, it's an enterprise thing, but you don't really need the people out hunting, right? Um, because of the traction that they got, because of their selling model, because of the ease of trying something and then buying it. Um, and of course, in consumer, you know, type stuff, you know, you don't really need that. But I would, you know, I think the PT, I think it was Steve Walski who is, is pretty firmly quoted as saying he give him the right the give him the lesser technology but the better sales force and he'd win every time um so i'm trying to think about like i'm thinking about turnaround stories or i think about sort of like when companies have tried to move from smb to enterprise and in that case like what dan uh, Fougere, uh, you know, has done, and Dave, um, probably what Carlos did, like taking a, something that's so open source and really figuring out how to gesticulate into a super enterprise sort of selling motion, that absolutely would say, uh, yeah, you know, the hunter makes the unicorn. Now, were those companies already going to be worth a billion dollars? Um, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> they're worth a lot more than one now. Yeah. Right. Well, well, look, Mark, um, I think it's a very, very good place to kind of conclude. And, you know, um, you know, just want to start off by saying kind of a big thank you, but I'm just going to try and summarize some of the things that we've heard in, in, in today's episodes. So we obviously heard today a story of a, of a, of an individual from a humble beginning um, you learnt your, your, your trade um, in sales, working a surf shop on the uh, on the west coast. And what what I think we've seen is someone with a real insatiable thirst and passion for making a difference, but really being excited by the things that you're having to sell. And I think how this has really helped you is it's given you the platform to develop as the artist because for you, it's never been work. It's always been about 
the enjoyment and, and, and using that real honest thirst and passion to, to build those champions and to therefore navigate deals in directions that would perhaps otherwise not be possible. Um, I, I want to kind of draw another, another conclusion here. And, and I think that going back to the whole, um, to the, to the whole, um, uh, Bones Brigade scenario, Lance Mountain obviously is, it, it, it wasn't necessarily the black sheep, but perhaps he was the one that would look around and say, how on earth did I manage to kind of end up here? And I think, you know, if yeah. you look at your, your background and how you landed in that blade logic environment surrounded by these Formula One drivers and world-class athletes, perhaps you might not have believed that you were worthy, but absolutely without any question of a doubt, you were worthy and not only were you worthy, but you were able to kind of succeed and, and, and break all barriers. And that's a real testament to, to you. So again, I want to say a real thank you to you. We've really, really enjoyed having you on the show. It's been absolutely fantastic having you. Thanks and for that. Uh, thank you so much for participating with us today. Yeah, no, that's really kind of you to say. I mean, I think um, you have to, uh, play the cards that the dealer puts in your hand, you know? <laughs> Such a played modest a, response. You played a great hand, Mark. But look, thank you yeah. so much for participating on this show. Yeah. Viewers are going to be really, really intrigued and interested. Wait, I have a, uh, I have a, I have a good way to, to exit here. Love it. <laughs> we can only do it in true Mark style, please. Okay. Here we go. Hold on. Is it going to work? Hold on. Can he surf that wave? All right, we're ready now. <laughs> Here he goes. Hit it. <laughs> 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 ha, 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 